The day will come where I'm not stuck doing most of this stuff on Zoom, but that day is not today. However, if you are going to be joined on Zoom, Jelly Roll is the guy you want to be talking to. It's good to see you. How are you? Good to do it. I'm actually having a great day. I'm having a mid-morning drink, and uh, I feel good, man. I'm excited to do this. This is this is cool, man. This is really cool for me. So I, I wish we were in person, too, so we could smoke a joint or something. But uh, I'll, do, I'll smoke one over here for you. Well, you know what? You and I are both in our uh, our work clothes from the waist up, which is What's the first. The Zoom, it's the Zoom way of doing it. It's like it's 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 like the clothing equivalent of mullets. You know, a <laughs> mullet is is party. Uh, you know, uh, work in the front, party in the back. Here, it's work on top, party down below. I'm I'm actually just wearing a jock strap right now. So no, <laughs> yeah, I just I just got a sock over my pecker. No, I'm sitting here with a pair of uh, regular gym shorts, and I was running around the house. My wife's like, "What are you doing?" I, was like, I need a shirt. I got to do a Zoom. And she was like, "What?" I was like, "Just something." I'm just like looking around for a shirt to put on over the t-shirt I got. It and, makes and me I, thinner. It thins me down. That's the trick. Accessories make big people thin. See, and, and now have have you gotten like me where, where you're so lazy about getting dressed now? Like putting on a t-shirt is like, oh, now I got to put on a stupid t-shirt. Where am I going to find clothing to wear? <laughs> yeah, no, it's the flannel. The t-shirt because I'm a big guy is like I don't like to let the let the let the tatas flop very often in public. So I always got a shirt on, but I definitely have moments where I'm like, oh, I need to put on a jacket or something. So were, were you always a big guy since you're a kid? Yeah. That's how I got the name jelly roll. I was a chubby kid and my mother called me jelly roll. Cause I like jelly donuts and I hate her because I spent my whole life trying to grow into the name. I'm now, joking. did you ever, I love her, but she did. She did give me the big man for real. <laughs> did was she ever playing you like old blues songs or anything like Mr. Jelly Roll Baker or anything like I, that? Je no, I did not know who Jelly Roll Morton was until I started making music and I had to fight him. You know how hard it was to win the Google War between Jelly Roll Morton and the pastry? I had to fight the pastry and Jelly Roll Morton. It was rough. There was years of my career that I was like on the seventh Google page behind pastry <laughs> rolls and Jelly Roll Morton. How do you win? How do you win that algorithm? Like, how, how does that stuff get done? I think the only thing that helped me was jelly rolls were not as popular as donuts. Thank God. And jelly roll Morton uh, missed the internet era. So uh, lucky for me, I had a leg up on it. Man. You know, give me some background because the thing is you've been making great music for a while, but you're fairly new to, to segments of, uh, of the rock population. So tell me all about yourself, where, where you grew up and how you were introduced to music, like all the histrionics. I'm one of the flamingos that is from Nashville, Tennessee. Grew up right here in a, a lower class, middle class community called Antioch, Tennessee. Always loved music. Uh, had a sister that played nothing but rock music. Had a daddy that played nothing but jazz and singer songwriter music. Had a mama that listened to nothing but Motown and Bob Seger. And had a brother that listened to nothing but rap. So I was the baby of the family. Had five siblings in the house. We were we were packed to the gills. Always had a, a homeless cousin sleeping on the couch. So. I was always getting these different influences of music is kind of how it came to be. The first thing I got into was writing poems, which led to hip hop, writing raps. I didn't realize I could sing. I was afraid of singing. And rapping didn't require a skill set outside of being able to rhyme words and tell a story in a rhythmic pattern. So it was just so much more obvious and easy for me. Kind of got into the guitar shortly after, started finding my voice after I got out of prison in my early 20s and landed doing an interview with Lou, baby well there you go what about that what about that for an elevator pitch i could have done that from floor one to floor 12 <laughs> you gotta admit that was impressive right it was like as fast as i could just get it all it's like jelly roll and a fortune cookie well you know let's go back uh, uh into that a little bit where where was the 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 first time that you could remember that you had some faith in yourself as a writer like w when did you figure out like hey i i can actually put these words together myself and and it's actually it feels good to do and it and it seems kind of cool. I started with like poetry and then I would freestyle at school. So the school I went to was predominantly black and it was very, I lived in a very mixed cultural community in general. And the school that we were bused to was mostly black. And I remember coming in every day in the in elementary, I mean, uh, middle school, like fifth, sixth grade, and they would be beaten on the table and rapping. Right. And I was like, I, I don't know why, but I just felt like I could do it. And I'd be like one of the only white kids that would stand there and watch every day. Now, keep in mind, I don't want to show my age here, Lou, but my rap story is a little different. Now you throw a rock and there's a white dude that could rap. 
crap, right? Back then, it was nobody. Like Vanilla Ice and the Beastie Boys was it. So a white dude rapping in the school cafeteria for breakfast or lunch was unheard of. And one day I just kind of jumped in and I didn't make a fool of myself. And I had the element of surprise because the expectation was so low <laughs> that, 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 that I just like any, the fact I could Dr. Seuss rhyme. And they were like, oh, you know, and instantly it was like, I might be able to do that. So I followed that for years. And in my early teens, I started really turning it into trying to write songs. So. My mother, we had a very big house. So, like, I was like the entertainer of the house in general. They was always like, you know, tell us a story, Jelly, you know, or whatever. They still call me Jelly to this day. Or, you know, sing us one of them songs you wrote or something. So I'd be like, I go grab my sheet of paper. This is the rap I wrote today. And I wrote a rap every day at school because I obviously wasn't paying attention at school. And I was just in there writing raps. And I'd come home like, what'd you learn at school? I'd be like, nothing, but check this rap out I wrote. My big brother would, like, oblige and listen to me for 40 seconds. Go, pretty good, Jason. You know, and I just kept chasing it. And then I started really falling in love with songwriting in my early 20s. Now, who are some of the early songwriters that you thought, well, here's somebody who's got something important to say, and you, you liked how they made the words go together? The first time my father introduced me to James Taylor, I just remember me just thinking, this is the coolest thing on earth. You know, I just remember, I remember being so moved by it. And then my father would tell me what he thought or what the legend of the story of the fire and rain was. Because James was famous for not doing a lot of interviews. So you just kind of had to interpret it and figure it out. And I just remember thinking, man, I want to write songs like this. And then I kind of got stuck into a bunch of the, to this day, my playlist is a lot of singer songwriters from the seventies. Jim Croce. Yeah. Bob, Jim, Jim Croce, I think was one of the most prolific songwriters ever. I would have loved to have seen where he would have ended up at if he wouldn't have died so young. Right. Cause you got to think people know him for like the, um, Operator, which was a great written song, and uh, Time in a Bottle. Um, yeah, I if I could put Time in a Bottle, I, but yeah. they don't think about the crazy stuff he wrote that was so different that I love. That I fell in love with the roller derby queen, right? He was writing songs about, uh, well, it's bad, bad Leroy Brown, the baddest man in the whole damn town, you know, like he was writing crazy records about stuff like box number 10, about stories that nobody, who would have thought to write a song about a roller derby queen? Like what a crazy concept that he's sitting in a bar and looks up and sees it and goes, I should write a song about that big girl over there doing the roller derby thing. That's just so cool to me, you know? So I've loved Jim Croce, James, Bob, uh, Johnny, Willie, that whole, you know, most of those guys were just were the guys that still to this day are the people I think about the most whenever I sit down to write a song. Now, when you do sit down to write a song, does inspiration come that easy? Do you see somebody walk by and go, well, there, there's somebody I could I could write a song about? Oh, yeah. yeah. As a songwriter, I'm always writing a song. You know, it's like a texture of things warped in time are the ones that get me the most. Like looking at your ring right now, I have a big gold nugget ring I wear right here, obviously. I didn't get dressed as good as you did this morning from the waist up. Yeah, right. Beautiful, right? Yeah, that's just, oh, what is that, by the way? Uh, it is one of only, I think there's only three solid gold ones. It's a five finger death punch American capitalist ring. And you wow. Really this light. It's got my initials and a diamond on the inside. God, that's awesome, dude. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're all good friends of mine. And I, I paid for the thing myself, but uh, yeah, yeah dude, they, first of all, huge fan of everybody in that band, by the way, I talked to Zoltan as much as I can. And he's just such a sweetheart. Yeah. I was just Chris talking to Ivan the other night. Yeah. I've known yeah. Ivan. 20 plus years back to moto grader and traveling with them and stuff. But God, anyway, so you were awesome. saying, but yeah, but it's like, I don't know. There's to me, it's like, that just brings a feeling to me. It's something about that old school gold ring. And as weird as it sounds, there's a song there somewhere. Would it be a good song? I don't know, but it's just, I wear one, you wear one. To me, it's like, it takes you back to the time frame of like, the late eighties or early eighties and the nineties, the big nugget rings, you know, that whole era. And it's like anything can trigger something in my head. It's like, that could be a song. Or uh, We were watching a movie one day and the girl in the movie said, uh, it was a joke, but she was like, it was like a funny movie. They're like, well, if your tears could talk, what would they say, Kevin? You know what I was like? Outside of the humor of that, that's a deep thought. I'd love to write a song called If Tears Could Talk. And me and my daughter ended up writing the song together. Mm. So 
as a songwriter, I hear a song at the grocery store and they just don't know it. You know, some lady behind me will say something or some, I love hanging out with older people too, because they'll give you the most song inspiration. You'll never know it. You know, had an old man, I never wrote the song, but he would, it's a funny song. I think about a Jim Croce way and I should still write it. But he said, uh, I said, I said, well, tell me something, tell me something I don't know. He said, did you know you can't trip a cat? And I remember that to this day. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, I thought about it. And I was like, he's right. You can't trip a cat. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, that's funny. I should think about that. You know what I mean? Like, there might be a way to write that in like a real Jim Croce roller derby queen way, you know? And, and by the way, how did Dr. Seuss miss that one? Because you'd think if, if a guy all was the cats write, and all the can't hats, trip a cat. How did you miss it? It's there. It's so obvious, you know? That old man told it to me. I thought about it every day for years since he said it. Do you ever write stuff as, I don't know if I'm going to describe this correctly, but do you ever write something nonsensical and then use it as the basis for something serious later? Like are you ever walking down the street and you see a dog and you start going, I'm walking down the street and I see a dog. Yeah, oh, going, yeah. oh I, that's not a song, but I can take that melody and turn it into something real. I don't know if I'm describing what, what I'm, no. I'm thinking. No, no, no. You're totally right. It happens all the time. Like, uh, it was uh, Save Me. I heard the somebody save me in a dream kind of, right? And I sung it for a few days around the house jokingly. Like, it was a joke kind of to me. It was like, somebody save me. Like, I said it real country and jokingly. And then it kind of stuck. And I was like, that could really be something. I didn't think it would turn out to be a ballad. You know, the big ballad that it is, the emotional song that it is. But I just remember thinking like, I don't know, there's something there in the melody. I'm goofing around with it, but so I don't know. I'm a huge fan of comedy. I don't know if you're much do much with listen to much comedy, but I love the way comedians work things out. And for me, songwriting is similar of like, you have an idea and you just kind of start working through it. And the cool thing about my songwriting style is I write a ton of songs that never even make it to demo. I'm just, I'll just, I try to write a song a day just to dick around, you know, just like, like uh, there's a story Burt Kreischer says he called one of his comedian friends. I think it was Doug Stanhope, OG comedian and said, what are you doing? He said, oh, just, you know, writing knock, knock jokes. You know, this is one of the biggest comedians on earth. And Burt was like, what? He was like, yeah, you know, just trying to come up with some goofs. You want to hear one? He's like, yeah, he's like sitting right there writing knock-knock jokes. He would never say them on stage, but in his mind, he was just working the craft out, man. He was just fucking around writing knock-knock jokes, you know? And also, you know, it, it's it's the same kind of thing when they were working on uh, the Manhattan Project, the atomic bomb in New Mexico. Uh, the scientists, they, there were a lot of games and puzzles and stuff there because they 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 needed things to keep their minds occupied outside of the work when they needed a break from the work they needed other things to sort of keep themselves you know keep the synapses firing inside you know yeah it makes total sense to me yeah just just kind of always messing around and figuring it out i'm just fiddling with it my wife will call me what are you doing i'm just fiddling with a song I'm just trying to i don't know does this sound like a good idea i have probably 300 song titles in my phone and it's again, the first time it, i've ever talked about my songwriting process with anybody this is cool really how yeah. the hell is that? How is that possible? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's like the most important part of what I do and the least talked about part of what I do. See, to me, that, that that's really one of the more interesting things that I like to speak to people about. And, and again, some people hate to talk about it. Some people won't talk about it. And there are some artists who are really good at writing songs. But if you ask them to describe it, no fucking way. They just can't. They just can't do right. it. They, they don't know mm -hmm. how to to explain to somebody who doesn't do it. Yeah, they, they can't put it into words, you know. Um, it's different for everybody. When I talked to Brent Smith about it and uh, Zach Myers, they were talking. They would say, "What's your favorite part of the business?" I said, "Writing the songs." They said, "That's mine too." When a blank sheet of paper, you go in there and fight the dragon or fight the demon. I forget which word he used, but it was an analogy of like I go in here and wrestle with this, and when I finish on that sheet of paper, I've conquered that demon or that dragon. I'm like, it's such a cool way to look at it, you know. It's like. Yeah, which once again, fighting dragons, what a cool song, you know what I mean? But what, what is it like when you speak with Brent Smith? I've known Brent like for a long time since before they actually had had a, a real name for the band. And when I get with him, it's I, I use a term music geeks talking music geek shit. 
And he yeah, and I start, you know, hey, you have a 15 minutes allotted time. And then an hour later, we're still yakking like old ladies. What is it like when you get together with him? Because I could see you two guys going for like hours at a time talking. Music. Oh, dude. Yeah, for sure. The few times I've got to really interact with him. I talked to Zach a lot, but the few times I've interacted with them both at the same time, it's just nerding out about the process. And I am a student of the game. So when I we was at Blue Ridge and they played the same day we played, I got to sing Simple Man with them. And I sat side stage and watched their whole set. And I love watching stuff from front of house because you hear it better and see the show as it is. Yeah. But I love when you watch from back of house because you see little intricate details that happen amongst the band, right? When Brent's back is to the crowd and he's looking at the drummer, right? And they're making eye contact and there's no camera and no crowd that can see him. I'm interested in how much fun Brent is having, right? You know what I mean? When Zach walks by and kind of picks on the sound man, the, the keyboard kind of winks at him and flicks something at him, you know, or flicks him off. It's like, I'm like, these dudes are still having the time of their life on this stage. That's so inspiring for me. Because let's be honest, you've been in this a long time, longer than me probably, and I've been in it quite a while now. You watch a lot of these dudes, it's just they might as well be going to the dentist today. They are literally on stage just like they might as well be sitting in the lobby of a damn dentist office waiting to get a teeth pulled. They dread it all day and then get on there and, you know, but they're disconnected and watching them do just, and that's the first thing we talked about when they came off stage. I was like, y'all are still really loving this. They were like, dude, if we didn't, we'd quit tomorrow. I was like, that's exactly how I feel. I'm going to write my last song the day I wake up and tell my wife I have to go to work. That's the day I'm going to call out. Yeah. It's so great to hear you say that. Uh, and and uh, I've had conversations like that before, uh, you know, how you need to, remain being a fan of music you know it doesn't matter how big you get you've still got to be a fan of other people because if you're not you sort of lose the thread of why you've gotten this in the first place and and a, a, an example i use all the time and i saw them again last year the rolling stones now they've been a band for almost 60 years they are still you watch ronnie wood and keith richards playing guitar up on stage they're having the time of their lives and you know what? I'm sure they're happy to do it in front of 50,000 people. They do it in front of five, and I don't think it would bother them, you know? To have an absolute blast. No, it's just, I mean, it's, I think that's the most important part of what I do for work is that I never call it work or consider it that. You know, now so I tell um, my wife, check the day I say I'm going to work today. I need to quit. That's the day for me. Ballads of the Broken is such a great album title because it, it's got a cinematic quality to it but i would put it to you why does it seem that broken people unhappy people sad things usually make for far more interesting songwriting than than happy people pain is an international language okay it's i see it in your eyes i feel it in your movements whether we speak the same language or not right or come from different cultures or walks of life Pain is an international language. I think it's something that we all share. And for so many years, people were scared to admit it or publicize it. Or it was kind of a kind of a hidden thing, right? Depression, mental health, things that we all fight inside of here, right? Um, it's such a, I think it was a Chester uh, interview I watched recently before he passed. And he was like, you know, my mind is a dark hallway I don't need to spend much time in. And I thought about that and I was like, you know, I think so many of us feel that secretly, right? So it's like the music sometimes, as a musician and a songwriter, more often than not, it's just my job to express something that words alone can't. So I have to somehow evoke and create a feeling. It's more important for me to make music that is felt than music to turn. You know, I don't care if people ever party to my I hope maybe one day I write a song people can party to and that'd be fun, but it's not the intention of my songwriting. Much like James and Jim and Bob and the people I grew up listening to, I want to write songs that make you feel something. And I feel like that's my job, whether I make you feel happy or feel sad or make you feel work through something that you're internalizing. That's the goal. So I always wanted to make music. I call it therapeutic music. That was my goal from day one. Tell me about Dead Man Walking. What sort of insight can you give into it and how it was made? It was a sad realization of lifestyle choices. I've struggled and I'm proud to say that I am sober for most of the things that have hurt me the most. But all the way from my obesity to 
my my binge drinking and the things that I struggle with that I internalize, I kind of had this idea of, you know, I'm just a dead man walking, you know, and it was like, I wanted to write the song, but I was very conscious of saying, but I don't want to write it in a super ballad, slow, sad way, you know, and uh, I just kept having that melody in my head that dead man walking just over and over in my head. And I didn't know where to go from there. And that's just kind of how it started. I just wanted to be honest with people. It's really a dark song. If you listen to it, it's just kind of kind of rocking. So you kind of sometimes it kind of gets overlooked. But the top line of it, which let's call a spade a spade here. That's the majority of rock and roll music together. Right. You know, my, my make more ballads, so it's more obvious, but that's something that drew, drew, uh, drew me into rock music. It is traditionally extremely dark. You know, I think about you talking about Five Finger. I love the single they had. Uh, was it on? Was it on Fate? Was it on F8? Uh, I'm a little throwed off today. I'm a little throwed off today. You know oh, yeah. About? Yeah. Right. It's like yeah, I'm a little bit. Off. What a, yeah. What a what a happy record. But what a what a sad top line. You know what I'm saying? It's like, and that's something I love about Ivan and them's writing style. They have this really weird way of making music that moves you. But when you really get lost in the lyrics and the top line of it, you're like, man, this is really dark, you know? So I think it, that's something that's big in rock and roll, right? Yeah, and he's a guy, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you could relate to. He, he did not have the, you know, the easiest upbringing and life threw him a lot of curves. And he, he's just channeled it and and sort of uses the writing process to um you know as therapy really and uh you know he takes he takes really bad things and you know it's the great the, one of the greatest things you can do in life take negative shit and turn it into positive shit you know yeah that's yeah. that's what it does yeah that's it use it as energy uh, i think you mentioned earlier doing a stint in uh, the joint unfortunately yeah, I've been well, back. I've been I've been in and out since I was like 15, 14 or 15. So from 14 to 25, I probably did eight of those years, eight of those 11 years, kind of some somewhere in the system. Just one right. bad decision after another. At a young age, I thought it was my responsibility to be the breadwinner for the family. And, you know, the various criminal activities led me to different incarcerations year here two years there three years here two years here just you know on and off my whole life pretty much until i had a daughter she was born while i was incarcerated she got pregnant while i've been home for like six months and i violated probation and during those six months i got a young lady pregnant had a kid while i was incarcerated came home she was almost two i met her at her second birthday party and right then i was like i gotta do something different so i started selling mixtapes out of my trunk that same kid is 13 years old and uh, have full custody of her. Awesome. And how's she doing? Awesome. Little songbird, writes songs, plays a little piano, plays a little guitar. Uh, she's the production manager for all of her school plays. She's, she's a blast, man. She's, she's hilarious. She's the best thing that ever happened to me, her and my wife by far. How is the, and, and I, I don't want to dwell too much on family stuff, but how is the theater program in her school? I, and the reason I bring it up, I am a huge believer, not only in music programs at schools, but theater programs. I, I had a great theater program at my high school and we just did amazing stuff. And a lot of the kids, fellow kids I worked with all in the media, they're doing TV, they're doing Broadway. They're, you know, I'm, I'm like the, I'm like the least accomplished of the lot, you know? Right. right. <laughs> Thank you. Did I bubble, but it's, <laughs> no, dude, I, th I think it's great, man. I'll tell you a true story. This might be too honest, but that's my personality. I went to the one of her school plays last year, this year, and I made a typical jelly roll mistake of getting really high before I walked in. And I sat down at the very back and I was watching it. And for a few minutes, I was kind of like, what is going on here? And then it dawned on me that these were a bunch of seventh graders. And at that moment, I was like, they're killing it. Right? <laughs> I was like, they're killing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, whoa. This is so good. And I was like, I instantly was warped in it. Like watching, it was a two hour play, like James and the Giant Peach, one set the whole time. The set never changed. They were all dialogue. And I was like, they're crushing it. Like to have nothing going on, you know, and it was just super cool, man. So I'm proud of her, man. I'm proud of what she's doing there. 
by the way, and I don't know if you watched the show, I vibed a bit on Bojack Horseman because uh, a few times he said like typical jelly roll mistake. And I'm like, wait, typical Bojack. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you don't want to end up like Bojack, man. Yeah, right. Yeah. I do have some typical jelly roll mistakes, but I'm working through them. <laughs> I love Bojack too. I love all of that weird adult animated humor. It is my secret passion at night. I will just sit there and get lost in anything that's adult cartoon. It's like the kid of me that comes out. Nothing better than smoking a big old fat dude besides size that old fat thumb of mine and just sitting there and watching BoJack or Rick and Morty or Solar Opposites or any of that shit. Now, now do you ever go back and watch anything old? Like, I'm a huge fan of, and, and BoJack is one of my favorite TV shows of all time, but I also love the classic Warner Brothers Looney Tunes. And prior to those, there were the Max Fleischer Studios, and they would do betty boop and the early popeye the sailors and these were these were pre-hollywood code these things are like fucking weird and dark you ever watch any of that stuff i have a little bit my sister who's a huge rock head the one that turned me on to rock music is in like that's her thing you go to the house right now she'll be sitting indian style on a sofa smoking a joint watching looney tunes for sure well you got to where are you where are you streaming it from what is, what is the is there a platform that who owns the rights to that stuff now? Oh, uh, the Fleischer stuff. A lot of that's on YouTube. Okay. There are some uh, if you've got uh, Prime Video, they okay. often have um, these sort of weirdo cartoon collections like, you know, classic cartoons, volume one through 20. And a lot yeah. of that is stuff that is uh, gone into public domain. And that includes some of the, the classic Warner Brothers that they, they let the rights fall away on. Wow. But you, you'll get these really mixed bags of um, some of it's really good and some of it's like early TV crap animation. It's just worth going through. And, and certainly if you're going to sit there, you know, doing bong hits and looking at old cartoons, you'll find a lot of real gems in that. Um, the Fleischer Studio stuff you can find out more about. And we just I think it was the anniversary of the birth of the woman who did the voice of Betty Boop we recently had. And, and so I put the Fleischer studios website uh, on the show that night. I, I don't recall her name off the top of my head, but she was still working into her eighties. Have you ever seen who framed Roger rabbit? Oh yeah, of course. I call my wife, Jessica rabbit to this day. Oh, no kidding. Well, yeah. Be Betty Boop appears in that, you know, she's working as a waitress. She's, you know, black and white cartoon in the color world kind of down and out. She's yeah. with Eddie Valiant. And that was the original woman who did her voice back in the 20s and 30s, doing her voice whenever they did Roger Rabbit in the 80s. Or wow. So, yeah. God, that was, I love Roger Rabbit. I'm still, to this day, I'm a fan of, I watch more cartoons than anything. The yeah. wife will get me into like some random show every now and then that we'll binge watch late at night together. But as soon as we're done watching a few episodes of it, I'm always right back to like, you know, well, family like, guy or something. <laughs> Anyway, Jelly Roll, been great speaking to you. Uh, always a pleasure. When do I get to see you out live again? So we're heading out on tour here in the, uh, you said you're outside of D.C. I'll be up there at the end of March, early first week of April. I got the, uh, I'm playing the Fillmore right there in Silver Springs. I will be there for you. Come on, baby. Let's hang, dog. This will be great. Yeah, we'll talk with, with two music geeks talking music geek stuff. We'll do it. I'll look forward <laughs> to it. I'll bring the cameras. We'll get shots. We'll have fun. 